Welcome back to the Steady Anchor Podcast. I'm Luke, your host, and today we are continuing our series through the creeds and councils of the early church. Today we'll be focusing on the Council of Chalcedon in 451 and the doctrines of Eutychianism and Monophysitism. You may already be asking yourself, what the heck do those words mean and why does it matter to me? Um, but So that'll be the main focus of our podcast for today. But before we get there, we announced last week that the Five Points Church Planning Podcast is officially joining our podcast network. That's the Society of Reform Podcasters. I'm glad to have those guys on. I've enjoyed their conversation so far. As I said last week, I personally feel called to church planting, and I'm encouraged to see more people discussing the topic from a, a theological and biblical foundation, not just, you know, how to get the most butts in the seats. So I'm encouraged and excited to have those guys on the network. If you haven't checked them out already, I'd encourage you to go and do so uh, and check out the rest of the Society for Forum podcasters while you're there. But in addition to that, we also have another show that's come on in the last week to the Society of Reform Podcasters. The new show is called Seeker Start. It's a relatively new show hosted by two of my good friends, Grant and, and Josiah. Um, it's a podcast kind of geared towards younger believers, people who are really stepping into studying and knowing theology and studying scriptures deeply for the first time. Uh, they have a few episodes talking about uh about being excited about theology, about um, what to do when when Bible reading seems boring and stuff like that. They've had interviews with their pastor talking about the importance of theology in the Christian life, and uh, I'm I've been encouraged by their conversation so far, and I am very excited to see what comes out from them in the future. Uh, Grant and Josiah have become two really good friends of mine. We grew up together, but we weren't super close when we were younger. But in these last few years, I've really grown to appreciate their friendship. So go check out Seeker Start and the Five Points Church Planning Podcast, as well as the rest of the shows in the Society of Reformed Podcasters. These are all guys that whenever I put podcasts on in the morning, I, I slide them to the top of the queue so I can make sure I get all their stuff in first. So it's... Um, it's sometimes it's a lot to listen to, but it's definitely beneficial stuff. I I am one who is very into podcasts. I mean, I got my uh, my Spotify unwrapped a couple of days ago, and I think the number was like sixty six thousand minutes of podcasts from January to November. So I I have a problem, but. <laughs> I'm one of those weirdos who, if I'm not doing something like in a conversation with someone or working on homework or reading my Bible, then I will be listening to podcasts. So, uh, and that's not counting like YouTube or Ligonier or you know, classes for a year of Bible college. But anyway, so check those guys out. Uh, I am excited to see more stuff come from them in the future. And getting into our topic for today, we're going to be talking about the historical character Eutyches um, and the influence that he had in this theological controversy that eventually culminates with the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So a brief recap, we have done this series at the last couple episodes covering uh, the different creeds and councils of the early church and why they are important for us today, what theological lessons we can learn from them, and practical lessons as well. So we started, of course, with the first ecumenical church council, which was the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, where they came together to settle the issue of Arianism. Arius was a bishop who was, or not a bishop, but a, a leader in the church and a theologian who is teaching that Jesus was not truly God. He was just a lesser divine being who was created by God the Father. And so the church came together to say, no, Jesus is God. He shares the same nature as the Father. He is co-equal, co-eternal, co-glorious with the Father and with the Spirit. And so that was confirmed at Nicaea, and then through a generation of conflict over that issue, um, uh, the Arians kind of resurfaced and reformulated, and it had to come back in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, where the church again came together and said, no, this is the true faith. This is the teaching of the apostles and prophets. This is the teaching of the God-inspired scriptures that we hold dear, that Jesus is Lord. He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel that the Father, Son, and Spirit are the three persons of the one God. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God, one being, eternally existed in three persons. And so 
That became the definition of faith that was clung to by all Orthodox Christians, and everyone who refused to submit to that was considered to be outside the faith, because this was definitional and foundational Christian truth. If you do not believe the truth about who God is and what God has done, then you cannot rightly call yourself a Christian. You cannot claim to be in right relationship with God and yet deny who he is. You cannot deny the words that he has spoken through the incarnate Son and through his word by his Spirit. And so the controversy uh, changes after that. Because now that the mainstream church, the Orthodox Church, the true Christian church, has accepted that Christ is God, then how do we articulate how he is both God and man? Uh, because there were a number of heresies that the church has had to deal with through the centuries. So we come to um, we come to the Council of Ephesus in 431, where uh, the monk Nestor or not the was he yeah the monk Nestorius. Um, becomes the patriarch of Constantinople, which is basically the bishop, the the head church leader in Constantinople. And he begins to teach that we should not call Mary the mother of God because she only gave birth to um, the physical nature of Christ. And the argument was that the implications of this teaching was that he was separating the two natures of Christ, so much so that it almost separated Christ into two separate persons, a human person and a divine person, in which case there's not one Christ and one Savior, but two Christs and two Saviors. And that causes all sorts of theological problems. In the next episode, we'll go through a little bit, and because these two councils are very interrelated, um, after the next episode, we'll go through and talk about Nestorianism and Eutychianism versus Orthodoxy, examining their theological arguments from the scriptures and comparing that to the ultimate statements of the church and through the scriptures themselves. So that'll be the next episode. But today we'll be talking specifically about the next council after Ephesus. So Nestorius was condemned. This idea that Christ was two persons and two natures was condemned. But after that, we have a monk named Eudikes, who begins to teach that, yes, Christ is not two natures and, one per- and two persons. Christ is one nature in one person. And this also causes important theological problems that impact the way that we think about who Jesus was and is and what he has done for us to accomplish our salvation which is why it becomes a major church controversy. And some underhanded tactics and some political maneuvering, um, really some backhanded and illegal activity, leads into this conflict. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So, um, just after, for the sake of context, we talked in the last episode about the Council of 431 and the union of, the formula of union in 433. So even after the the conflict was settled, the Council of Ephesus, after all that whole debacle was sorted out, there was still debate over how we should interpret it. And if we were going to reject Nestorianism, then what should we believe moving forward? And so in 433, both of the parties and kind of both of the representatives of the different schools of thought within Christianity uh, came together with this formula of union, which is a declaration that gave laid out the basics of what we should say and what we shouldn't say. And they both said, great, that we have some space to agree on. But there was still conflict between these two groups and about the implications of some of the teachings there. Um, so we have these different groups, especially the followers of Cyril of Alexandria, who uh, become very, uh, just as Cyril was, they became very aggressive in defending his theological position um, and, and very wary of anything that sounded different to what Cyril had described. And so we have another of characters that are starting to come onto the scene and start to set the stage for this larger conflict. So... Um, Let's see. So Theodosius II is the emperor at the time. Um, in a couple of years after the Council of Ephesus, he gets a new grand chamberlain who is like a, a prime minister of sorts. Um, and his name is Chrysaphius, which you learn a lot of fun names doing this stuff. Uh, and Chrysaphius was the godson of a monk in Constantinople named Eutyches. Now, Eutyches was the leader of a group of about 300 monks in Constantinople, and Eutyches was convinced strongly of Cyril's position, 
Uh, he was very committed to the, the one person of Christ, so much that in his understanding of the discussion, he began to teach in his, to his monks and to the people who came to study under him that Christ was not only one person, but he was also one nature. He was immersed in uh, the different writings of past generations that he thought were orthodox, but were actually Apollinarian writings that were written under the names of orthodox theologians. So Apollinaris, if you remember from previous episodes, he was actually at one time a friend of Athanasius, but he began to teach that Jesus and the Word, the Logos, are separate. So the Logos is the divine Son who then came down and inhabited the body of Jesus of Nazareth. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's good for what we're going for. And so there's, it was condemned at the last council, but these writings still had Apollinarian influences, and this influence impacted the way that Eutyches was thinking about his theology and how they influenced his understanding of Cyril and what happened at, at Ephesus. And so he begins to teach that before the Incarnation, there were two separate natures, the divine nature of the Logos and the human nature that was in Mary, of, of Mary, it was in Mary the mother of Jesus. And so before the Incarnation, there was two natures, but after the Incarnation, both of these natures were united into one in such a way that he's, he's articulating it in such a way that the Logos took on flesh. So Jesus, the person of Christ, is still maintaining his divine nature, but he has added to his divine nature a human nature. And because that human nature has been kind of subsumed under the divine nature, then it cannot be considered its own separate nature. And so this becomes uh, a problem because of his imprecise terminology. He's in the same way, almost, that uh, in the same way that Nestorius was kind of conflating the terms for nature and person, Eutyches basically does the same thing as the enemy that he so strongly opposed. And so in his articulation to keep denying against Nestorianism, he eventually comes up with his own heresy. In denying that Christ is two persons and two natures, he comes up with the other false idea that Christ is one person and one nature. And so people begin to push back on this. Theodoret of Cyrus is another theologian who says, well, what about impassibility and immutability? These things that we know from the scriptures that are true about the divine nature, if, if the divine nature has been in some way mixed and combined with a human nature to make this new third type of nature, then how can we maintain that the divine nature never changes and cannot suffer? Because in, in Eutyches' um, understanding, in the implications of his theology, that would mean that the one nature, which is divine, suffered on the cross. And other theologians had articulated it that, obviously, it was the human nature of Christ, the human body that suffered on the cross, because the divine nature cannot suffer. The person of Christ suffered because he possesses both a human and divine nature. But Eutyches begins to push back against this and say that, well, no, if you're saying that Christ has two natures, you're just bringing back Nestorianism. And so he starts to push back. He begins to appeal to the leaders and authorities over him, and even to the emperor, who he has a connection to because of his godfather, who is now the grand chamberlain to the emperor. And so he has this connection that he uses to get his influence into the imperial powers. Um, so he starts to uh, cause a stink, basically, in Constantinople. And so uh, the patriarch of Constantinople, the bishop in, in charge at this point, is a man named Flavian. Um, and he convenes what's called the Home Synod, which is a gathering of bishops that was kind of routinely meeting in Constantinople. And he calls Eutyches to appear at this Home Synod so that they can deal, th deal with these issues, so that they can work through this theological controversy and hopefully find a peaceful solution between the parties. And so Eutyches shows up. He shows up not only with kind of his own gang of, of monks, but also with a large number of imperial officials that are following with him. So he's kind of showing up with his whole gang, showing his, his strength that he shouldn't be messed with. And so they start to dialogue about his teachings and theology and try to define terms correctly and examine the scriptures. And he keeps being 
he keeps pushing back and saying, no, 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 you can't say two natures in one Christ because that's just more Nestorianism. And so it comes to the place that he confesses that Christ's humanity is not consubstantial with us, meaning that while the divine nature of Christ is still the same nature as the Father, the human nature that's within him is not the same human nature that we have. And so this becomes a, a bombshell because, as always, always been understood within the church, if Christ does not, art- if he does not, uh, if he does not become incarnate and take on the same nature that we have, then he will not be able to redeem the nature that we have. It's become a staple throughout this patristic theology that what the Son does not assume, the Son does not redeem. And so if Jesus is is kind of mixing the two natures into his one person, where he is kind of God and kind of man, um, that not only is he not fully God, which by implication would uh, disagree with Nicaea, and he is also not fully man, in which case he would... Um, fall into the Apollinarian camp. And and Nestor, um, sorry, Eutyches obviously disagrees with this interpretation. He thinks that he's just holding on to the true faith. He's holding on to the orthodox teaching. And so he keeps pushing back to the point where he's excommunicated. He is denounced as someone who is a false teacher, and he is kicked out of the church. He's taken away from his position of authority over the monks in Constantinople. And so we see an imperial council that gets called at Ephesus. Because again, Eutyches has this connection to the emperor through his godfather, who is uh, Chrysathius, the grand chamberlain in the imperial court. And so uh, the, emperor, the emperor Theodosius II calls for another meeting in 499 at Ephesus, which is the same place that the Nestorian controversy had been dealt with just a few decades earlier. And so there's about 170 bishops that are presiding, and there's a man named Dioscorus who presides over the whole thing. And Dioscorus, we're going to see, is actually kind of doesn't really have the purest motives. Um, there's also a lot of difficulties with this. For instance, they, they send out for... Um, they want this to be an ecumenical council of sorts, and so they send out for representatives from the various uh, parts of the church, So they send to the Bishop of Rome, who is a man named Leo, and they ask him to send representatives or maybe to show up in person. He says, no, I'm stuck here. Um, At 499, Attila the Hun was invading Italy. Um, So that kind of throws a wrench in things. It makes it a little little difficult to travel across the country for theological debate when you have the Huns knocking at your front door. But Instead of attending in person, he writes this big theological document called the Tome. It's the famous Tome of Leo. And then he sends it with his representatives, the, the papal legates, all the way to uh, Constantinople or to Ephesus. And so uh, so they get the representatives. It's the time for the for the council to start in Ephesus in 499. They're gathering these people together, and Dioscorus opens it up. And then the first action of the council at 499 is to say that everyone who is involved with the home synod that condemned Eutyches is disbanded. They are excluded. They're not able to participate in this council. And they obviously throw a fit with this. They're saying, like, why? We, we acted justly. We were just acting as we were supposed to. We were with, well within our rights as bishops to condemn this man. And Dioscorus says, no, if you're already predisposed against Eutyches, then you can't be a part of this. And so they're forced out of the chairs for debate, and they're cha- forced into ju- basically the, the seating for people who are watching. They weren't allowed to speak. They weren't allowed to contribute. So basically, they start by silencing all of the opposition that's going to continue to condemn Eutyches. Uh, Dioscorus has basically packed his court with people who are going to support the reinstitution of Eutyches and condemn the other people around them, condemn everyone who condemned Eutyches. So we have some complicated political maneuvering here. The papal legates who have this tome, this book from Leo, that was supposed to be addressed to the council to explain the Western Latin understanding, they ignore it. The legates are like, hey, we have this thing from the bishop. Are you going to at least let us speak? And they say, no, you don't need it. Don't worry about it. And so 
by force, basically. They take charge of this. They reinstitute Eutyches as the leader of his, of his monks. They rehabilitate him as a true member of the faith, or so they claim. And then the Patriarch of Constantinople is deposed. They say that, well, since you were part of this, that can, this so-called council that condemned Eutyches, then you're not allowed to be in power anymore either. And so this causes an outrage. They, um, Emperor, uh, Patriarch Flavian and another person from the council, Eusebius, object strongly. And when they react in hostility with their outbursts, Dioscorius, uh, Dioscorius basically plays like he's being attacked by them. And so he calls for the imperial guard. The doors fling open for the council chamber. The captain of the Imperial Guard comes in with his men and even some random Egyptian sailors, and they start grabbing all the people who have been condemned and hauling them out of the chamber. Flavius goes, Flavian goes into exile, and he actually ends up dying because of this. He, because of his wounds, because of the conflict, because of the trauma of the exile, he ends up dying before he can even go to where he's being exiled to. So the council, um, the council continues with this. They keep pushing for a stronger and stronger position in line with what Cyril had taught. Now, at the Council of Ephesus in 433, the council accepted Cyril's second letter as an orthodox definition of the faith. His second letter that he had written to Nestorius, they said, yeah, that's, that's how we want to articulate it. That's true and biblical. But his third letter, which was written before the council, but after his second letter, obviously, contained a list of 12 anathemas against Nestorius. These were a list of 12 condemnations that were against Nestorius and all these different aspects of his teaching. And they were so extreme that they were beyond the limits of anyone from um, Nestorius' side being willing to concede to them. They were very extreme and not altogether reasonable. They weren't altogether well-reasoned out either. And so we have the, the council just continue to go further and further. They're condemning all the people who stand against them. They condemn Nestorius again. They condemn um, everyone who stood against Eutyches because they think Eutyches is the guy who's truly representing what Cyril said at the council. And so word gets out of this. The papal representatives get back to Rome, all barely escaping with their lives, basically. And Pope Leo at Rome condemns the, this, this, what he calls a robber council, the robber council of Ephesus, these den of robbers who, who snuck in and with underhanded ways corrupted the truth. Because he thinks this is unjust. He thinks that not only was he ignored, which is enough to ruffle anyone's feathers, much less the Bishop of Rome, but also that they are, with underhanded ways and illegal actions, condemning people without a fair hearing, without a fair trial, that this is no true counsel at all. It's all a farce. And so he starts to write letters appealing to the other leaders in the church, and he even writes letters appealing to the imperial family for their help on the, on, on the issue. And so in the midst of this, uh, another twist, another turn of events, Emperor Theodosius II, who at that time had been supporting the the Cyril party, the robber council, dies, falls off his horse, hits his head and dies. And so he's succeeded quickly by his elder sister, Pulcheria, who marries a military or a senator named Marcion, who is an ex-military general. So she basically takes power again, and Marcion gets elevated to the next emperor. So one of her first actions as the new empress is to execute Chrysaphius, who was the godfather of um, Eutyches, who had brought these whole powers together in the first place. And so the new emperor and the new empress call for a council to be held at Ephesus again in 451 for the next year. And so they want to reverse this decision. They want to undo the injustice that was done to the people at the robber council. They want to have a fair trial where everyone can come and communicate honestly and openly. They want to make sure that the imperial powers are there directly to make sure that nothing corrupt happens. And so the tide begins to turn. Uh, the the Cyril's, the, the hardcore party that was supporting Eutyches was starting to lose all of their support. 
And so it comes to pass that um, in 451, the bishops start arriving at Constantinople, but uh, the imperial parties can't actually get to Ephesus because of more invasions from the, Hun, from the Huns, like Attila the Hun and their whole army. And so instead of going all the way to Ephesus, they decide to just move the council to a city right across the river from Constantinople, a city called Chalcedon. Now, I do want to just make a side note that I do pronounce it Chalcedon because the first letter is a key, sometimes pronounced a chi. It's, a, it's the X letter in, in the Greek alphabet, but it pronounces, it's written like a CH in English, but it's pronounced like a hard K. So it's, in Greek, it would be Chalcedon, but uh, Chalcedon is the way that I think is most appropriate to pronounce it in English. Some people call it Chalcedon or Chalcedon, and I that just rubs me the wrong way. Um, but that's completely besides the point, and someone could probably prove me wrong if they tried hard enough. But So they moved to Chalcedon. I'll just move forward pronouncing it like that. To uh, the city, which is just across the river, they find a suitable meeting place, and all 500 or so bishops attend this big meeting in 451. And so at the start of this meeting, uh, they begin with the imperial powers, all of the different representatives from the different parties. They have the representatives of the Pope there again, Pope Leo. They have the representatives from Jerusalem and Alexandria and all the big uh, theological powerhouses in Christendom and the empire at the time. And so they come together. Um, and the first thing they do is basically put Dioscorus on trial for his misconduct at the robber synod of Ephesus, the robber council. And so basically they put him on trial not only for misconduct, but also basically for the death of Flavian. Because again, the previous patriarch of Constantinople was exiled, roughed up, and basically died because of it. And so they're not taking any chances. They want this to be dealt with first off, and then they'll get to the theological problems. So Dioscorus stands trial for his misconduct. And eventually, one by one, when they're going through the theological conflict and, and analyzing the way that he handled the issue, his allies start to desert him. People like Juvenal of Jerusalem, who stood by his side at the council of the robber council of Ephesus, says, you know what, you're right, this is wrong. We're, this is a losing battle. We did the wrong thing. I want to cross over. And so his allies start to desert him. Dioscorus um, eventually ends up being alone, ends up being condemned. They, they declare that the actions and the deliberations of the robber council of Ephesus were illegitimate, and therefore they should be dismissed. And so it goes back to the place where Eutyches has been condemned, and Flavian is posthumously reinstated, and uh, Dioscorus himself is now being condemned. So the council goes through with the next session and goes through and declares what they do believe to be orthodox about theology. They reread through the creeds of Chalcedon, or sorry, through the creeds of Nicaea and the fuller articulation at Constantinople. They say that, yes, this is the true faith. This is the rule of faith. And then they read Cyril's second letter, which they had confirmed at Ephesus uh, just two decades earlier. And so they say, yes, we believe this. This is true. And then they also read the Tome of Leo, which is that influential, articulate summary of Western theology from the Pope at Rome. And so it's basically a summation of all of the Latin theology that had come about the Trinity in Christology uh, through the early, earliest church fathers like Tertullian all the way through Augustine. And so it's a really uh, good articulation. I actually did a paper on this a few semesters ago about you know, looking through different aspects of atonement in um, the Tome of Leo and Athanasius on the Incarnation. So how that's besides the point. But I think it is actually a good read. Like if you're looking to go deeper into stuff like this. Athanasius on the Incarnation and the Tome of Leo are great places to start. So, so they affirm all these things as orthodox. They say, yes, yes, this is what we believe. This is what scripture teaches. This is the true faith. And so uh, with the understanding that, again, they don't want to make a new creed, rather they provide another definition a, an articulation, maybe an expansion to Nicaea and Constantinople and Ephesus. They just want to add on a further clarification about what the church teaches about the natures of Christ. 
And so they produce what is called the definition of Chalcedon, which reaffirms that Christ is one person and two natures. He is truly God and truly man, but yet still the one person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the eternal Son of God. And so this is their articulation that they want to avoid both the errors of Nestorius and the errors of Eutychius. They don't want to separate or divide the person of Christ. They don't want to divide his natures so much that there is no contact there. But they also don't want to mix the two together into some third type of nature. It's like you don't want... Um, it. It's hard to articulate because it's kind of metaphysical language and... Obviously, it's it's philosophy, it's theology, it's in another language from centuries and centuries ago. But um, they don't want to separate the person of Christ, but they also don't want to mix him together into a third type of thing. So what they see that Eutychius is doing is kind of like taking a cup of red water and a cup of blue water and then pouring them together and making green water. They, they feel like that's what he's doing. He's mixing these two natures into one new mixed nature. And so they want to deny that. They want to say that, no, Christ is one person, the person of Christ, Jesus Christ, and two natures, the human nature, which he assumed through the incarnation and the virgin birth, and the divine nature, which he has always had and will always have. And so these two are not mixed, but neither are they completely separate. They are, they are held together in this hypostatic union, which is a miracle of the incarnation. It's something that it ultimately goes beyond our understanding because there is nothing else like it in all of creation. But yet it is how we articulate what the Bible teaches about the incarnation of Christ. And so this is the definition of Chalcedon. Uh, in the next episode, we'll be going through the articulations of Eutyches and Nestorius about their arguments, and then we'll be reading through the definition of Chalcedon and the formula of union and how the church, the true church, responded to the heresies of these two people. And so uh, they produce this definition, and they all heartily agree to it, um, and then they continue with another smaller matter. So when you have all these bishops together, you want to address more issues than one. And so uh, they go through, I think, a list of 30 or so imperial canons, which are just rules for the administration of the church, which is also interesting because I think it's canon, it's either 18 or 28, I think it's 18, where the council said that they acknowledge with greatest honor, old Rome, which is the city of Rome, for being, you know, it's the seat of Peter. Peter. It's the seat of Peter. It's, um, it's the old capital of the empire. It's a city of great faith and history. But they also want to acknowledge new Rome, which was Constantinople, and acknowledge the authority that the new capital of the empire has. And so that did not go well over with Rome, which at this time they were starting to develop these theologies of papal supremacy. Um, obviously, this had been not as developed and contested even in the West. Um, but at this point with Pope Leo, he's starting to say, no, I still want to I still want to say that Rome acknowledges no rivals. And so this is where we start to get the, the real papacy. Because as we know today, the, the papal powers of the Pope of Rome, what we know today through like uh, Pope Francis, who is a nutcase in himself, but even like the more conservative and orthodox popes through the last years, um, what we know through that is nothing like we had in the early church. Like the papal doctrines developed over centuries and centuries. They were not what was originally held. But we start to see them begin to develop more clearly around this area, which is why there's conflict now between Constantinople and Rome. But that's another side issues. So we have this declaration of Christ as one person in two natures. And uh, for the most part, the church heartily agrees to it. But there are still a couple people who hold out for this idea that Christ is one person in one nature. They're called the monophysites, which just means one natureites. So these are a people which continue to hold that they reject Chalcedon and 
uh, they confess Nicaea and Constantinople. They confess Ephesus even because they hold strongly to Cyril's positions, but they don't want to go as far as Chalcedon did. And so there's a group of Monophysites who reject Chalcedon. And there are even some today who still fall into this Monophysite camp. I believe the Coptic Church in Egypt is one that believes this, and a lot of churches throughout the Middle East, uh, a lot of smaller churches. Um, and so you have these Monophysites who remain within the empire, and in the next generation, they begin to resurface again in the same way that Arianism did. And a good 35 years down the road, the church begins to schism because of it. Um, and we'll get to that in a later episode. So for the next episode, again, we'll plan to go through the arguments and the exegetical understanding made by—sorry, I don't know if you can hear, but my cat's meowing— so annoying sometimes. <laughs> he is a destructive little monster. He's so cuddly at times, but he is also just so clumsy and breaks everything. Anyway, so we'll go through in the next episode uh, the articulations made by Nestorius, made by Eutyches, and how the Orthodox Church responded. In the next episode after that, we'll probably uh, be talking about the next couple church councils uh, because this is the last main church council. Basically, the next few councils are just highlighting and articulating more about what was decided on Chalcedon. Um, those would be all just one together episode. So like, this is the fourth ecumenical council at Chalcedon. The fifth one is dealing again with the issues of the natures of Christ, and the sixth one is dealing with the wills of Christ. How many wills does he have? You know, does Christ have one will or two nils or wills, or is will an aspect of person or of nature? And so we'll talk briefly about those controversies. And then uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which will be very interesting because it's the one that actually a lot of, orth I would say, Orthodox Christians disagree with. I, as a Protestant believer, as someone in the Reformed tradition, would say that I do not confess the Seventh Ecumenical Council, because there are a lot of portions to it that I do not think are biblical, neither are they ecumenical. Um, so we'll get to that controversy later. We'll deal with that issue as we get there. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, sorry if my voice is a little raspy. I got I ran out of water, and I feel like I talk way too fast when I record this. So... Um, thanks again for listening. Thanks for sticking with it through this series with me. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, I would love for you to reach out and address those. So you can follow us and, and uh, message us anywhere on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Steady Anchor Pod. You can also email us at Steady Anchor Podcast at Outlook.com. Or you can find us on our website, doctrinaldiscipleship.com. Reach us through that email, doctrinaldiscipleship at gmail.com. Um, basically, if you want to get in touch with us, you can. We have some excited stuff coming up in the future. I'll probably announce more next week. But until then, I love your neighbor. Dang it. I messed it up. Until then, love God, love his church, and love your neighbor as yourself. God bless.